Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Gary J. Whitehead, a poet whose work I have admired for years because of its clarity, depth, and richness. Gary does a wonderful job of capturing the complex and sometimes contradictory relationships we have with the natural world, language, and the people around us. In Gary's newest book, a glossary of chickens, he explores those relationships through a wide range of topics that include chickens, the sea, Herman Melville, Lot's wife, the past, and grief, to name a few. Every page surprises and delights because Gary's keen observations are matched by his skillful craftsmanship. Gary has published three books of poems, his work has appeared in The New Yorker and has been featured on Garrison Keillor's radio program, The Writer's Almanac. He teaches English at Tenafly High School in New Jersey and lives in New York's Hudson Valley. I'm thrilled to have him here today. Gary, welcome. It's so nice to finally meet you in person after meeting you through your poems. It is. Thank you for having me, Elizabeth. It's a delight. So you have a poem that you are going to open with. I do. I thought I would start with the title poem, A Glossary of Chickens. There should be a word for the way they look with just one eye, neck bent, for beetle or worm or strewn grain, gleaning, maybe, between gizzard and grit. And for the way they run towards someone they trust, their skirts hiked, their plump bodies wobbling, bobbling, let's call it, inserted after blowout and before brood. There should be terms, too, for things they do not do, like urinate or chew, but perhaps there already are. I'd want a word for the way they drink, head thrown back, throat wriggling, like an old woman swallowing a pill. A word beginning with S, coming after sex feather and before mm. shank. And one for the sweetness of hens, but not roosters. We think that by naming, we can understand as if the tongue were more than muscle. Mm. I love the specificity in the detail of that poem. But I have a couple of questions. Why a poem about chickens? And why a glossary of chickens? I did raise chickens for about three years when I lived um, up near West Point, near Bear Mountain, New York. And I developed a real love of chickens, um, keeping them for a few years. But that poem really came about when I was doing a writing residency up in the Adirondacks. And uh, a fellow poet and I would put the chickens to bed, so to speak, as soon as it turned dark so that they wouldn't get uh, killed by a coyote or whatever. And one day, this poet handed me a glossary of poultry terms from a book on raising chickens. And with really no explanation, handed it to me. And I wrote the poem as a thank you to him and left it tacked on the door on my way out, knowing he would find it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, it's really a thank you poem. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you go from one thank you poem to many chicken poems and the title for this book? Well, I, I had already written one chicken poem, The Coop, which is in the book. Um, and then when the book was accepted, the uh, series editor suggested that I change the title to A Glossary of Chickens for the overall collection because he, he really fancied that, that title and thought it would be intriguing to readers. And so then once he did that, I, I sort of thought about maybe some other types of chicken poems I might add in there um, that aren't really about the bird. Mm -hmm. There is one chicken poem that I'm thinking of, and I believe you're going to read that for us. But before you do, tell us a little bit more about the other chicken poems. Uh, well. One of them, I, I, I tell the narrative of um, a, a bunch of chickens that I had that were killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a sort of revision uh, story in that um, I want to recast what happened and place the blame on mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. in that poem. So I, I use the narrative in a, in a kind of um, twisted way. Mm -hmm. 
in many of your poems, you're recasting something. It may be an experience, it may be a phrase or a word, but you have this wonderful ability to help people see things in new ways. And that is certainly the case in the chicken poem that you and I talked about. Would you read that one for us? This is the wimp, I take it? Yes. yes. OK, sure. They called me the wimp, and I was. Not for any reason I can put my finger on, but because, in general, I lacked wherewithal. I was a poltroon, and none of them knew that word or any better than wimp, and probably they still don't. If one of them does, I wouldn't know so. Those years before and during and after high school swirl in my memory now like squalls of snow, like the time when, on a whim, in late December, my friends and I told our folks we were going camping in the wildlife refuge two towns over, the flakes already falling, our gear pitiful hand-me-downs, none of it insulated or waterproof, rum bottles clinking in our knapsacks like muffled toasts to the end of our young lives. Inches had fallen by the time we bivouacked at the Caratunk Cave. Wet kindling whispered, not even leaves would catch. In five o'clock dark, we crawled into the tent, soaked and shivering and stoned, no one willing to state the obvious that we might die out there in what we all knew by then was a blizzard unpredicted. Who it was had the wherewithal to suggest we pack it in, I don't recall, but I remember humping, drunk and exhausted, through two-foot drifts in the hushed woods, my toes gone numb in thin boots, our flashlight beams a mix-up mystification panning over moguls of snow-covered brush. I wouldn't have minded expiring there under the laden arms of a spruce. The past is a distance, and life has at times been a stumbling through thick drifts, batteries dying. They'd think of me still as the wimp. So there's the future, like the lost pair of sneakers we found in the spring, and growing between their double knotted laces, a sapling. Mm. There is so much in that poem the natural world, the struggle that human beings have to define ourselves and outgrow labels that others place on us. Then there is also the, our relationship with language and how we are changed by the effort to find the right word, to find that right poem. What stands out to you about that poem? Uh, I agree with you about the struggle for the right word. Uh, there are several poems in the collection that deal with that. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I think that um, writing poetry is an exercise in failure mm -hmm. in that language is a flawed thing. It's, it's symbolic. Words are symbols made of letters, which are symbols. And so I don't think they can ever completely convey the true feeling we want them to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I'm always grappling with in my writing of poetry. But what really stands out for me in that poem is that it is about a true story. My friends and I did go on this camping trip in the middle of winter. I don't know how our parents ever let us do such a thing, but they did. And um, we had this experience. Um, and I wrote this poem as a way to sort of show these old friends of mine that I'm not the wimp anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the kind of um, chicken poem that that one became. Mm -hmm. It's a way to, uh, to kind of show them mm -hmm. who I am now, because mm -hmm. they don't really know that person. Mm -hmm. That's another great example of how you recast what people think they know. And you show us something that we don't know. Right. You are very drawn to the natural world. And nature shows up in many poems in this book. Tell us a little bit about why you're drawn to the natural world and the tension of, of loving that, but yet also loving the man-made world and some of the comforts it provides. Yeah, um, you know, the, I mentioned camping in that poem, and it's something my family did when I was younger. I think we started when I was about seven, and despite a rocky start, it was an activity that we engaged in every summer and sometimes in the fall. 
and in the spring. And um, I really loved it because as a boy, I was always drawn to the woods. I always loved nature, always fascinated by animals, by insects, by the things of the world. And you know, I still am. I'm an amateur naturalist, a birder. Um, I, I love still walking in the woods. I take my dog in the woods almost every day. So um, yeah, nature is something that um, I'm always thinking about. I try to put myself in it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I've had some experiences where I was really um, immersed in nature, one being the um, writing residency I did in 2005 in southwestern Oregon, where I lived off the electricity grid in a cabin with my dog for six months, mm -hmm. very far from any other people. Um, so yeah, in, in that setting, nature was just all around me. And so many of the poems I wrote out there uh, were rooted in nature mm -hmm. as a subject. Now, when you returned from that experience, what was it like to sort of reintroduce yourself to the real world? Yeah, it was something I was really afraid of. I remember when I was getting to the end of my writing sabbatical there in the cabin, thinking, oh my god, I have to return now to living outside of New York City, um, in suburbia, mm -hmm. where there's you know millions of cars, bridge tolls, I mean, all of these things that I just really didn't want to deal with, living mm -hmm. as I had been in a place where I didn't have to carry a wallet or a watch or care what day it was. Mm -hmm. But you know, once I got back and I settled again into my job as a teacher, it just sort of seamlessly came together for me again. And um, I was content to be back in the classroom meeting my, my students who I had, you know, was meeting for the first time after they were in school for two months with a long-term mm -hmm. sub. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, I think, part, partly helpful in me coming back to civilization, mm -hmm. was having a job working with young people who I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were able to, to go away and really focus on your writing, you were deeply engaged in the solitary life. And writers need that solitary life in some form to really create the kind of poems and, and the environment for writing that we need. How do you maintain some aspect of the solitary life? It's always a struggle, especially from September to June, mm -hmm. when I, I have so much on my mind with mm -hmm. um, you know, teaching, marking papers, constantly mm -hmm. thinking about the next lesson, um, constantly sifting through what I read, what I encounter in the world, and thinking about ways to maybe integrate that into the classroom. So yeah, um, it, it's definitely something I need when summer comes around, when I have a vacation, weekends. I need that quiet time, and I mm -hmm. carve it out for myself whenever I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very good advice, actually. Carve out that time whenever you can. Another theme, another thread in the book, is the sea, and you also have some poems that reference Herman Melville. Can you tell us a little bit about that thread? Sure. Um, I grew up in Rhode Island, and so the sea is just part of my, my past and um, my present, too. I, I'm, I was just in Rhode Island uh, today, and it's something I think about a lot, um, where I came from. And um, I also am infatuated with Herman Melville and stories about the sea. And I did a, um, a program several years ago for, uh, for thanks to a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, studying Melville with about 13 other teachers from around the country. And I became very immersed in, in reading Melville. Mm -hmm. I like to teach some of his stories in my classes. And uh, he's just somebody who's been in my consciousness ever since I did that NEH mm -hmm. seminar. So he found his way into the book in several poems. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you look at those poems, what do you think he has brought to them? Um, I think an appreciation for language, mm -hmm. for the integrity of the sentence. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I love to teach Melville mm -hmm. just to illustrate to students the beauty of his sentences. Mm -hmm. How does the beauty of the sentence work in poetry? I think it's all important. Um, you know, for me, poetry is really about sound and structure mm -hmm. and image. 
Mm. And I think if you can marry all of those things together mm -hmm. in a skillful way, mm -hmm. you'll have a, a strong poem. And so that's what I try to teach my students as well. Mm -hmm. And I think um, coming to that, you need to have a mastery of syntax. Mm -hmm. You need to know how to put together a sentence. Mm -hmm. So. Um, my students hate me for this, but I often force them to study punctuation and to use it in their poems. And then I tell them, once you've mastered it, then you know, uh -huh. leave out the punctuation if you want to. Uh -huh. But I don't want to see a poem full of haphazard punctuation and that sort of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, I've, I've always you know, been unsure whether that's the right approach, because it might turn certain kids off from writing. Uh -huh. But I think it is important. And, and um, I think students need to know how to write a complex sentence. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. It's interesting that you are focusing on the sentence because so many poets will say, oh, you've got to really focus on the line or you've got to focus on the stanza. But when you start to think in terms of sentences, it really does change your perspective. I think so, too. And um, I've had a lot of students struggle with the line versus the sentence mm -hmm. and wrapping their head mm -hmm. around the idea that the sentence can continue over many mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of beginning poets, they want to have an end stop line that's one sentence long and mm -hmm. then another line that's one sentence long. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. You can enjam lines and mm -hmm. carry them across stanzas mm -hmm. if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love about this book is that you examine so many aspects of experience including grief and loss of relationships. Can you tell us a little bit about how you think of grief when you're writing? I think that the writing is therapeutic in getting through you know, times of loss. Mm -hmm. um, I went through a divorce, and so after that, I wrote a lot of poems about it. And mm -hmm. uh, my last book was full of divorce poems. Mm -hmm. This book has a few of them. You know, it's still something I think about. I'm remarried. I'm happy. I'm content. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm writing fewer divorce poems. But, mm -hmm. but it's, still, it's still something that I feel. Mm -hmm. And um, you, know, you go through stages in the grief, in the loss. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think writing has been a way to work through a lot of those feelings. Mm -hmm. In a way, it allows you to recast the experience. And that often happens by degree. Yeah. So there is a moment, I believe it is in the last poem. Yes. The last sentence of the last poem. Above the green plateau, there is always grief which inspired becomes the breath of life. Tell us a little bit about that idea. Yeah, I, I was really happy when that conclusion came to me. Um, I felt, OK, that's a good ending. Mm -hmm. And it's a good ending to the book. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's kind of a hopeful line that mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. out of grief comes inspiration. Mm -hmm. And grief is part of life. Mm -hmm. So this is a mm -hmm. poem that is about uh, Noah mm -hmm. as a very old man. I think in the mm -hmm. Bible it said he was 600 years old or something mm -hmm. like that. So I don't know quite how old he is in the, in the poem. But he's old, and he goes, he climbs to the top of Mount Ararat, where the ark landed, and he looks down and sees all of this creation, mm -hmm. which is all a metaphor for the making of the poem. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's what that ending is all about, mm -hmm. that you have to go through the grief. It's part of it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I love the way that in these poems, you're sort of gathering the animals as well. And you're gathering so much more mm -hmm. than the animals. You're bringing so much into your arc so that you can help us get through the turbulent times. That's a nice way to think about it. There is one other poem in the book that has a biblical connection. Tell us a little bit about that. Lot's Wife, mm -hmm. yeah, so that poem grew out of a teaching experience. I was teaching uh, Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, and in the first chapter he says the book is a failure because it was written by a pillar of salt. And so I spent the class period explaining what that meant, mm -hmm. who Lot's wife was in Genesis. And on my drive home that day, I just had this image in my mind of people coming upon the salt statue of Lot's wife after mm -hmm. the destruction, the two cities that were remaining. and. Um, 
I, I started to write the poem in my car while driving, which I don't recommend people do. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> so anyway, I had a few lines by the time I got home, and that, that was the impetus. Mm -hmm. And then I sat down and finished it and went through a, a few drafts of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, as you think about the book as a whole, do you find it interesting that you've got Lot's wife on one hand and Noah at the end of the book? Is there a connection there? Yeah, I think, you know, um, I, I did have in mind having a biblical thread in the book mm -hmm. as well as the Melville thread, the chicken mm -hmm. thread, the mm -hmm. divorce, um, the natural world. There are all these different threads working through the book. And I liked that there was a biblical poem at the beginning, one that dealt with human frailty, and one at the end that also deals with that. Um, mm -hmm. And in this time, it's somebody as an old man looking at what he's created. And I guess sometimes I feel that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as I get older, mm -hmm. I want to look back at what I'm doing and thinking about, is it important? Is it right? Am mm -hmm. I doing it well? Mm -hmm. Now, you have three books of poetry. And this book, it continues some of the themes and threads from earlier work, yet it also has a lighter feel to it in some ways. Did that surprise you when you looked back at the collection? It did. And as it was coming together, I was thinking to myself, all right, there's a few funny poems here. This is great. And mm -hmm. then some of the poems that I didn't think were really that funny, I read at readings. I did many readings this spring after the book came out. And people were cracking up in the audience about certain poems. And then I realized, all right, these are funny poems. There is a kind of mm -hmm. wry humor to them. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's a direction that I'm, I'm glad that I've been moving into. Because mm -hmm. I think there's too much you know, sad poetry out there, serious poetry. And mm -hmm. we need more, more light poetry. Mm. Oh, I agree, definitely. The book has so many different subjects and threads. How did you put it all together? It's always the challenge for the poet who's writing a miscellaneous collection, I think, mm -hmm. um, instead of one that sort of has an overall themed idea. Um, but what I usually do when I'm putting the manuscript together is I take all of the poems that I think are book worthy and I put them together and then I um, spread them out on a big table and I think about, all right, here's a grouping. And when I used to edit a poetry journal, I would want to put the, the journal together in a similar way, where there's sort of woven threads mm -hmm. where one poem spills into the next in a thematic way mm -hmm. that's interesting for the reader. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to do when I put together a manuscript. And I did that with this book, too. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised by the way poems wanted to line up next to each other? Uh, yeah, yeah. It always happens that way. And then other times, I felt, all right, there's a gap here. I need some mm -hmm. bridge. And then I would sort of think about that as I was composing poems. And um, I think some of them that wound up in the book made that bridge. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. What's your favorite poem from the book? I think it's the title poem. But there's another one I like a lot, too, which is Owl Pellet I Show My Students. Because it, it has this kind of light, funny ending, mm -hmm. but I think it also conveys the tenderness that I feel as a teacher toward my students. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the great joys of being a teacher is discovering new groups of students every year and sort of falling in love with them. They're such, mm -hmm. they're such mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know, open vessels wanting to be filled and, you know, taught. Mm -hmm. Do you introduce them to poetry? I do, as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's their reaction to that? There's some kids who are amazing poets in high school. I, you know, if I can't mm -hmm. get over how good they are. Mm -hmm. And I have high hopes for them when they're writing such well-crafted verse in high school to imagine mm -hmm. them when they're my age, what they might be doing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was it exciting for you when this book was chosen by a very famous editor? Yes, it was. I didn't think it would happen. And um, when it did, I was just bowled over and overjoyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And it's been a great experience. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, Paul Muldoon was the series editor. I think he's stepping down after this year. I'm not sure about that. Mm. But um, so he had published some of my poems in a magazine. And then 
um, invited me to submit a manuscript. And I worked all summer long to put one together, to finish it up, and sent it in. And then I didn't hear for several months. Mm -hmm. And you know, I didn't think it would ever be picked. And then he sent me this email saying he was really taken with it and wanted to, wanted to, to publish it. So mm -hmm. I was honored to be not only selected by Paul Muldoon, but to be in such great company with all mm -hmm. the other poets in the series. Mm, it's a wonderful book. Thank you, Elizabeth. We're almost out of time. So will you come back at some point? I would love to. OK. Yeah. And will you close with another poem? Sure. How about if I read Spice Rack, since we were talking about some other I relationship thought you were going to read Owl. Oh, I palette. can do that. Oh, Either you're an one. Owl you lover. choose. You're you an choose. Owl lover. I'll read, I'll read the Owl Pellet. Yeah. Good, good idea. So this is Owl Pellet I show my students. This gray loaf full of tiny bones, a gift I found on a park road, like something a car drove over, once mouse or mole, but now a skeleton sewed into one undigestible measure. No more than half an ounce, this used to be whiskered skitterer who once engaged in nocturnal pleasure. Not so unlike you, reckless, reckless youth. Scapula, fibula, tibia. What is it that surrounds all these bones? In truth, I cannot say. Just as I cannot say what will one day, under its caped wings, gulp you down whole, my soft little <laughs> mousies, my tender moles. Thank you so much. Thank that you, Elizabeth. wonderful. Yes, we're HCAM TV, but movies also? Dive In Drive In is a new program featuring the HCAM staff's favorite B-movies. Check our schedule at HCAM.TV for the next showing of some of the more forgotten films. Black and white or color, join Mike Terosian and myself as we introduce and give you some interesting facts about the cast and crews of classic movies. We hope you'll enjoy these treasured films of yesteryear.